Any other thoughts from the panel? Yes, Dave. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, I'll be brief in my comments, but you know what? What you guys do is wonderful, wonderful work. It's really outstanding in every way. But we, there was an old adage many years ago in the Farmer's Almanac that said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And, and once people have a, a disease process um, that requires intervention, then it's going to be expensive. What we, try to, what we need to try to figure out is how do we then focus on primary care prevention and wellness as alternatives. Once people are ill, then you have to do what you need to do. But what can we do as a society uh, to focus on those issues before they get that ill? Uh, you know, we spend a lot, of, a lot of money on taking care of individuals that come in with very significant um, problems and or disease processes. But the question we keep asking ourselves is what, what should we have done for this individual to prevent them to get to this point? Uh, so I think we're going to have to really focus on, on those as priorities. You know, if, you know, I've said many times before, what if 100 years ago um, the, the reimbursement system had been set up so that all providers, hospitals, and doctors got paid for keeping people well and got paid nothing when they were ill? Would things be different today? I think they would. So I believe we need to get back to basics. Uh, we need to get back to prevention and try to identify problems before they get very expensive. And one of the things the reform bill does not address um, is our personal accountability for our health. We need to talk about those issues at some point, but I believe that the best way to approach the cost curve, or to bend the cost curve, if you will, is to focus on not getting people to that point where they need intervention. David. Uh, limiting my comments to the acute care setting for the moment, uh, but acknowledging and, and agreeing with the things that, uh, that David has said about the pre-hospital environment, uh, most of you will be aware that that St. Luke's Episcopal uh, Hospital uh, is a house that was built by cardiology and cardiac surgery. And uh, <coughs> one of our ongoing uh, opportunities is to try to channel the many, many practitioners uh, in those uh, broad specialties uh, into increasingly predefined pathways. So standardization. Uh, since the beginning of my career uh, at the University of California uh, Hospital in San Francisco, so many objections to this standardization approach uh, have been uh, put forward, starting with it's bad for graduate medical education, uh, that we have to have people who experiment with different approaches uh, learning from uh, their errors as uh, uh, most have in the most hallowed forms of medical training over, over the many years. But uh, today, uh, when the inpatient environment uh, is faced with the kind of changes that are in front of us, which I'm sure we'll be addressing in more depth in, in, in following questions, uh, becoming a focused factory is very, very important. Now, uh, uh, not being a physician myself, I recognize uh, as I talk to people about the philosophical transformation that's necessary to standardize, it becomes always clear <coughs> that this is about the last reason a person has chosen medicine as a profession. And that that career selection has been driven by a belief that there would be a maximum opportunity for personal professional autonomy. Uh, and I think our society supported that for a very long time, uh, but it's fairly likely through the economic hand of the government uh, to be quickly followed by uh, private uh, initiatives in the insurance sector that those degrees of freedom uh, are not going to be supported going forward. So. If one uh, accepts the change in the paradigm, uh, I think the, the process standardization, uh, getting to consensus in a given uh, cardiology service or uh, a cardiac surgery service as to what's going to be done at what time, under what indications, 
uh, is really very, very important. And, and this is quite old business, I think, for the most closely integrated systems, but it's quite new business, relatively speaking, for institutions like, like my own that have been built on top of independent private practice. Mark, as a CEO as well as a physician, how do you see other opportunities? We talked about uh, prevention. We talked about education for our generations, even including ourselves. I mean, do you really know what, what is the cost of a certain procedure? I mean, most people don't know, have no idea, no earthly clue. And uh, there's quite a bit of variation from one hospital to another. And we talked about standardization. Uh, of maybe an approach, a guideline, and we'll talk about that, Ralph, also. But Mark, from your perspective, how do you see another way for us to, to look at that? I think uh, you touched on some of that just in your remarks now, but physicians and hospitals have to lead this effort. You know, we, the government solutions, the managed care solutions are ultimately not going to bend the cost curve. They're not going to result in more cost-effective care. I think when we, the people who are at the front lines taking care of patients, focus on the best things for those patients. We can focus on quality and outcomes, but also cost as part of that. And so that triple aim is incredibly important because you know, certainly when I was trained, cost never came into the equation whatsoever in anything. Probably one single lecture I had in medical school or residency or anything else after that. And, and I think that, that frame shift, that mindset that we as clinicians, we as leaders of hospital systems have to focus on the cost part of the equation as well. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So we've been trained in this mindset. You go into the room with the patient and you're focused on that patient only right there. And uh, I still agree with that. But if you carry that to its extreme, that means you're going to do everything under the sun for that patient. Where, uh, you know, when we start thinking a little bit more on a population basis, you're gonna recognize that if we don't focus on the cost side, when you spend a bunch of money here on patient A or thousand patients like patient A, you don't have the money to spend on the thousand patients like patient B. And so how we get our heads around that I think is going to be a, a major societal shift for us because it's, it's not the way uh, that we've all focused on that. Um, I think we need to start right at the beginning with the educational system and we need to work with our, our you know, upcoming medical students uh, on you know, how do you look at cost effectiveness. We need to be teaching them and giving them the tools to understand that. You know, we do a terrible job. Right now, I mean, I, I have an IT system here. You know, why doesn't my IT system, when, when you pull up the list of drugs, say, you know, when this one costs 50 cents and this one costs $50? The clinician actually might take an extra second there to think, which one's a little better? Well, guess what? We just saved $49.50 if they make that judgment call that there's not really a meaningful difference in those drugs versus just simple prescribing habits that we would normally see. So it's, it's a multifaceted approach, I think, that we have to move that, that kind of cost consideration into what we do. Ralph, uh, <laughs> your perspective in, in different ways, obviously Ralph chaired or was an instrumental, certainly, in, in the appropriateness use criteria from the college perspective, from the American College of Cardiology, uh, is in a, an integrated system how do you perceive this, Keep it, maintaining quality in mind, but looking at that portion of value, which is cost? Well, thanks, Bill. Before I, I offer my comments, I wanted to thank you, Bill, uh, from the American College of Cardiology and having us down here, and also Mark and, and all the people of Methodist for the incredible tour that we got of your great facility. Uh, we really enjoyed the visit. and. The leadership of the college uh, really appreciates being with all of you today, so thank you so much. You know, um, uh, <coughs> Don Berwick talks, of course, about the triple aim, and he mentions how at least 30% of waste is in the system. And uh, the challenges that we learned earlier today, listening to Mark, is how we understand where the end of game is, where the goal may be, in terms of revamping uh, uh, how we actually uh, reimburse, trying to go to a system that truly is based on quality while presently we're on quantity, and how we have to get prepared in dealing with that during that transition. People talk about accountable care organizations, for example, and is this really a rationing thing, or is, can we achieve the 
bending the cost curve through getting rid of uh, inefficiency and, and waste. Uh, comments were made earlier about uh, management within the acute care hospitals, and we heard earlier today, for example, Methodist's approach in terms of decreasing sepsis and other effective tools. Interestingly, when you talk to Carolyn Clancy, this has been a number one problem from the Agency of Health Research and Quality. All of their efforts in trying to decrease uh, never events have not been incorporated in our nation's hospitals like some of the things that would be de done here. Obviously, that has bad results for the patients and obviously increased costs, and just dealing with that would save a lot of money. Uh, great comments were made about the training system. I think we have a huge problem here because the way we train our residents and fellows is we, we do imaging, we teach tests, we, the way we, we have to order more tests for them to understand that learning, but we don't incorporate appropriate criteria. So as they leave the education system, they're not really trained to, with which to do such. And those comments are great that we need this training paradox to incorporate how to be, best order. And we need to identify our variations of care because that's really where we need to go in terms of being able to decrease uh, a wastage in use. And to first do that, we have to measure what we're doing to be able to identify those variations. And then, you know, thanks for the plug about the appropriate use criteria, but that may be at least one of the mechanisms that we have to try to eliminate unneeded testing. Now, I will say about the appropriate use criteria related to imaging and revascularization is that the college, uh, although is proud of this en endeavor, also appreciates that it's in its awkward adolescence. In other words, we have to show to ourselves that this application of this tool doesn't have any negative unintended consequences, and also we got to show that clinical outcomes uh, remain good. And the last comment is the issue of shared decision making, because uh, there's been a lot of research that when you actively involve patients and families in shared decision making, which I don't think we adequately do in the United States, when adequately informed, oftentimes patients and families, particularly in the elderly, may choose less costly options and more conservative options. These are great comments, uh, Ralph, and, and all of you. Um, you mentioned there a shift from maybe in a payment models. Let, let's talk a little about payment models because I think they're very important there. The current payment model is fee for service. Although if, if you look at, oh, we have quite a bit of variety. I know we have the chief of cardiology from the VA hospital. Uh, believe it or not, this country, in this country, we have all payment models that are thought of almost in the world of how to provide care. You have some entitlement programs like Medicare and Medicaid. You have the VA system which, you know, within a budget you provide the care. You have the fee-for-service model, which is the predominant one throughout. And uh, you have self-pay for individuals who are, you know, uninsured who still have to, to pay. So we have basically all these various payment models. And while shifting in principle from a volume, meaning the more I do, the more I get or at least sustain myself, or whatever it is, be it for hospitals or be it for, for physicians, while shifting from this model to something that would look at quality and outcome as opposed to the volume of care, we have tremendous challenges. I know most likely, I think we will see this, most likely this team of, of healthcare experts there think that this is the future. I don't know whether it will be an all or non phenomenon, most likely a kind of hybrid kind of situation. But at the same time, I think the panelists, I'd like them to, to relay the challenges that we have while transitioning from one system to another. Transitioning from one system where this is how you make your livelihood to saying I'm going to use much less and therefore I decrease my income and maybe my livelihood to this other system <coughs> poses challenges. So the question to the team here is how do you see this play out 
keeping in mind that I don't know what the you know, uh, Accountable Care Act will, will ultimately uh, hold to after June or whatever it is or with elections. But let, let's keep this at least off the radar screen and think of if really we want to move into this kind of healthcare system where we reward health, we reward outcome, uh, yet at the same time we have to make sure that we are sustainable as healthcare professionals in addition to hospitals. How do, we, how do you guys see this moving in a practicality point of view? Is this a gradual thing? Uh, how do you see this from a practical point of view? Because as we push appropriateness use criteria and quality and decrease utilization, uh, we're gonna have screams from this audience and others. Well, let me, let me, let me start by saying, I, I really am not looking forward to this. It scares the heck out of me. <laughs> you know, it will not be fun. Um, you know, there's only 30 hours in a day. We gotta make the most of them. What scares me is what's being proposed in the reform bill, which is called bundle payments. I think it's ridiculous, it's absurd, it's silly, it's crazy, I don't like it, but you know what, at some point, we may have to do that. And once we're in the same room trying to figure out how to make this thing work, this will not work unless you have our medical staff buy into the concept. You know what, we, we ought to have a, a 10 minute pity party and say we don't like it. And after that, we suck it up and we say, all right, how are we gonna do this? And, and, and what we need to do is focus on quality. If you focus on quality, then costs will come down. But, but I think what's gonna happen is that once we are put into that environment where we have to figure out how we're gonna do that, and, and quite honestly, the rules have not been written for how to do that just yet. It's a, it's a theory that has a lot of problems with it, if you will. But if we get to the point where we are told, here's your, here's your dollar amount, you figure out who's gonna get how much, that's gonna be a not a fun meeting. I think we'll probably have to use Foley catheters for people who don't wanna leave the room. Uh, when that dis discussion is being discussed about who's gonna get how much. But I think once we get to that point, we're in the same boat. Uh, we've had in the past, as you know, we've had denials of admissions for hospitals um, and physicians get paid. Uh, so I think once we're in the same boat with the same challenges, um, then we will really uh, do this the right way. Now, is there room for opportunity? Yes, there's room for opportunity. My fear is that we'll go so far in the other direction that we're gonna hurt patient care. That's a real potential unless we do it the right way. So I think the, the bundle payment idea, I think within five years, it'll either take legs or it's gonna die. Do I think the reform bill is gonna get overturned entirely? No, portions of it may be, but I don't believe the bundle payment issue is being discussed or reviewed. But I, I think once we get into the same boat with the same, um, I guess, vested interest, then we'll do the right thing because we always have. So providing the right care and the right quantities at the right time and the right setting becomes a critical uh, path for us to address. We have two Davids on the opposite ends of the panel. So. <laughs> <laughs> David. Okay, so uh, my comment uh, is really intended to be uh, particularly provocative, um, but, not, but not representing either Republican or Democrat philosophy, really. <clears throat> I personally believe, and so having been through uh, the great sign curve of regulatory efforts in American medicine since uh, about 1973, uh, we forget quickly that a lot of the things in the so-called Obama plan started in the Nixon administration. Uh, so at one time they were sort of good Republican politics and now they've become sort of the third rail uh, for the Republican uh, congressional uh, contingents. And I, I actually believe that much of the discussion about accountable care, individual mandate, bundling is really just a policy question on the fringe of the question that our government and the learned profession in medicine uh, have been constitutionally unable to really address. Uh, and I would frame it something like this. We all hear over and over how the percentage of gross domestic product in the United States 
is twice or more that of other Western economies who are achieving twice the good results with half the money in terms of uh, quality adjusted life years and, and, uh, uh, and good health, if you will. But what is much less discussed is that this critical difference in national <coughs> expenditure doesn't really separate in these same Western countries until about age 60. I mean, France, Germany, England, the United States, more or less until age 60 are spending, give or take, <coughs> the same proportion of their GDP. Our expert health economist can call me out if necessary. <laughs> but after She's that, that <laughs> our curve looks like this. I mean, it's like a launch to the moon. So the question, the policy question from my standpoint is what is the social contract going to be in our country? <coughs> now, of course, the moment in the, in, the, in the public policy debate uh, that ended up being the Affordable Care uh, Act and law, that the notion of a granny commission was sort of whispered in the dead of night, uh, where nobody thought a single ear could possibly hear, but there must have been a member of the press in the alley. Uh, this is the third rail of politics. I mean, nobody can go there. Uh, we have today at <clears throat> St. Luke's uh, next door a really, really wonderful uh, elderly uh, woman, uh, about 86 years of age. I know I can't give you too many identifiers here, so I'm going to be very careful. Uh, who had a wonderful intervention to all evidence, hugely successful last week by one of our most accomplished cardiovascular surgeons, uh, and I think has a reasonably good chance of, uh, of full recovery. And I mean, if the statistics uh, are on her side, I mean, two, three, four, five years of, of life ahead of her that would not have existed absent this intervention. But I don't think this procedure would have been done in any of the other countries I've named. Uh, and so I think it's really the social contract that's central that nobody is really prepared to address. I mean, there's, there's uh, a lot of literature. <coughs> I mean, I, I assume you see some of it in, in, in your professional publications, but uh, if not, come over to the health policy literature now and again and see how many Medicare beneficiaries have a surgical intervention in the last six months of life. Now, the people who are undertaking these procedures are well-educated. Many are sitting in this room and probably have a pretty good prognosis when they undertake this under our current social convention, which is everything for everyone. And so I don't, I don't personally think until the nation matures enough and the learned professions guide government sufficiently that the core of this cost equation can really be overcome. Because I don't think bundled payments really, which will promote uh, a lot of polite and not so polite haggling between physicians and, and healthcare executives uh, or insurance uh, organizations and, uh, and hospitals uh, uh, or whether or not you're employed or, or, or not. I just think those, to my way of thinking, are honestly peripheral to this central question of, of what is the social covenant going to be. I think, David, you, you put it very nicely. Obviously, it touches on a very essential part of, uh, of care, at least in the United States, and its implications regarding cost. 
and at times you could even towards the very, very end of life, and I know in all of our hospitals and other facilities, you just start wondering about the element of futility very late, late on in life. And I think this is a societal thing that I think our society hasn't really addressed, and I, I fully agree with you. This is part of that equation. Now, the other portion is obviously this shift. And I know Mark today, you know, Mark addressed us today uh, regarding, you know, his, his vision of where would things would be going from uh, volume to more quality. And I think what David just mentioned is actually part of quality. You know, how do you manage end of life or the elderly with, with a lot of comorbidities? I think this is what we're dealing with here. And how do you find quality at that stage of life? So, Mark, few thoughts regarding, again, volume, quality. How, how, do, you, how do you foresee this for our adjustment? Well, just picking up a little bit on what I said before also, you know, it, it, it all, all has to be about value, that value equation of what are the outcomes over what is the cost. And right now we have a system that obviously values, using the word value, values volume more than it values the quality side of the equation. It just, it just does. Um, I think, you know, if you ask questions like, does the Accountable Care Act make a difference or not? What happens in June? What happens in the fall? You know, I think fundamentally my answer would be it's largely irrelevant, um, it, w whatever happens in June. It's going to affect the pace of change, I think. It's not necessarily going to affect the fact that there will be change. Because if you look at the reasons, you know, that, that Dave has been talking about, others have been talking about, if you look at the reasons for why we are sitting here debating these kinds of issues, it's because fundamentally what we have in this country is completely unsustainable. I mean, it will not function over the long term. So what we all don't understand is at what point you know, does that burst? I mean, at what point can we no longer sustain what's been going on? We thought in the 90s we were, we were at that point, and then clearly proved not to be the case. Um, we think we're here again in, the, you know, in this decade. Um, if you, if you, if you uh, do a, a chart of life expectancy in the United States versus cost in the United States, and you do that for other developed countries, you can get a pretty straight line um, out there. So here's the line. The United States is out here. Either we gotta spend close to half as much as we spend now, or we should be getting another seven or eight years of life expectancy. And it's not the 86 year old who got those couple years. These are population prevention based measures uh, that would drive us there. So if you then take the, the assumption that the world's going to change, you know, the, the fundamental questions of things, as David says, that makes these jobs really hard for all of us right now is how fast to where, you know, and all those kinds of questions. I think we will shift to some sort of payment methodology that de emphasizes volume. I don't personally subscribe to, you know, therefore let us take full risk and be an insurance company. Um, that's, we tried that experiment for the country. Um, there are going to be organizations that, that do want to do that and thrive in that. I mean, Kaiser's a great example of that, but I don't think in, in much of the country that makes sense. Take the city of Houston. You know, the average doctor practice size here in Houston is probably less than two um, in terms of group practice size. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous to think that you could suddenly shift and take full risk. Um, you know, so, you know, somewhere there has to be payment mechanisms that allow everybody to share as you bring the cost down and as you focus on that value equation without necessarily having to organize in such a fashion as to take the risk if the costs go up. And I do believe um, that is achievable. Um, some of that is a little bit done in the Accountable Care Act, um, you know, Affordable <laughs> Care Act, rather. Uh, but I don't, uh, I don't think it's been well executed in many cases. I think most of this is going to happen front lines with, you know, people in this room working with different employers, different payers, and others trying to trying to craft um, some of that course. It has to be incremental. We can't all blow up what we're doing right now. You know, the fact of the matter is life expectancy in this country has skyrocketed over the last uh, several decades. It's just it could be even higher for, for what we're paying. Uh, you know, we've driven down uh, the, the rates of death from heart disease pretty substantially. Cancer, I think we're on about a 1.5% per year decline in death rates right now in our country. So there's a lot of great things going going on. And we're now at the cusp of, I think, you know, a next revolution in how we provide health care that is going to be potentially uh, jaw-droppingly expensive as we start thinking about sort of personalization of medicine and, and at the individual level uh, how, you, how you target therapies. We have to figure out how we take that opportunity 
and make that a cheaper option for us, not a more expensive option. You know, simple example, if I, if, you know, if I, if I try and treat a patient in my practice with hypertension right now, I don't know, a cardiologist will, will get me on the data here, but what, maybe 75% chance somebody's going to respond to an individual agent, maybe I'm even being over optimistic, and then I'm going to try another and try another and try another until I, until I have that, to have that work. We've got to figure out scientifically how we can then say, you know, for Mrs. Smith over here, it is drug X, and we don't end up with those kinds of ways. So a lot of the things we need to do scientifically is, is improve what we're doing, educationally improve, um, and ultimately to solve all these issues. If we don't wrestle control of it, that unsustainable bubble at some point, you know, when a bubble pops, as we've seen a couple times in the last decade, it is really painful. And if we, we don't seize control and do this, and that bubble bursts for us, it's going to be extra painful. It's much better for us to figure incrementally how we can take charge of some of this. I mean, so somebody ultimately is paying for this. Uh, you know, in, in my little article, they said, well, you know, I mean, if you're paying so much and uh, we have administrative costs, we didn't talk about that, but the, the way to administer care nowadays is take a look at your offices. I mean, you are an employer of so many people that have very little to do with healthcare. And if you take a look at that, it's at least three times, three times any other country that comes <coughs> afterwards. So tremendous you know, effort and cost and a lot of waste there. And I think you know, focusing on quality, again, is, is moving that bar <coughs> towards the quality portion it is the challenge of how do you get you know, reimbursed for that. And I agree with you. Personally, I think it's going to be an incremental thing. Uh, Ralph, I wanted you, your perspective because uh, not on your past president hat, but on your Kaiser hat. Uh, it is a model that we don't have in the city, uh, nor in the state, I think. I don't know, you, David, you, you correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, how do you, I mean, is really Kaiser driven by less volume, more quality? They, they really look at a very integrated system. Uh, how does it work? Well, thanks. Uh, before I answer that question, uh, making it an infomercial, which I don't want to do, I, I want to address a, a couple of comments. Uh, David uh, talked about the issue of uh, end of life and how the, uh, we as a country need to uh, really give some thought in a, on a uh, true uh, social uh, national effort. But you know, we have begun to uh, have that dialogue. You know, there's a lot of data, you know, from the dartmouth winberg Atlas, so the variation to end of life. And there are a lot of lessons learned there. Whether, you know, the amount of money spent in the last six months in New York is different than in, and down in Southern California versus Northern California. And then, then we take that and actually interview the family about their own satisfaction. Turns out you can't interview the patient, they're dead. But when you interview the family, there is no relationship in their happiness, or you know, relative happiness, about the care that Aunt Millie got based on the expenditures and how they're cared for. So I think that's a huge message to us as clinicians in stepping up and, and having that dialogue. It is so much harder uh, to, do, to do nothing or, or to do comfort care than it is to do something. In fact, in the growing model, I think, related to hospital-based physicians, where we've lost the continuity of the patient's primary physician, who knows the patient and the family best, is not at the bedside making that decision. They're at the people making those decisions are the people that know the patient the least. And that leads to doing things rather than having the important conversation. And most of the times, if the family was involved in the conversation, and us, really, this is what we are as clinicians, can help relieve their guilt about making the right decision, I think we would be in a better place. So that's my end of life uh, discussion. In terms of how we deliver care, we have the end of the spec one spectrum of fee-for-service, of course, the global capitation model, which of course is Kaiser, happens to be uh, Kaiser Permanente. And, you know, clearly, I think, from my perspective and many perspectives is we are moving out of the fee-for-service um, uh, range. And we need to, in all honesty, prepare ourselves for those who, who are in that. And there are lessons learned that we can have in trying to examine that middle ground, whether it be 
payment of epi by episodes of care or bundle payments, and we've heard the pluses and minuses, but that is in the transition. We're going to have to figure that out in terms of uh, as people make this transition. Now you asked about uh, Kaiser per and, and things about bundle care and uh, episodes of care that we can learn from is we got to be at a point where we're not ordering the grand casino of all cardiology tests, you know, the five or six tests or seven tests. We got to learn, let's order the best test, the right test, and uh, rather than multiple tests. And again, hopefully through appropriate use criteria, our multimodality upcoming document, we can help clinicians prospectively make that decision in ordering these right tests, getting them prepared for these middle ground change of payment models, whether they be bundle payments or episodes of care. Now in global payment, it only really works if you have a huge population base. So the challenges related to small practices doesn't play out well. But it's a kind of an interesting thing when you think about this beautiful, incredible medical center that we were toured on today. <clears throat> At Kaiser Permanente, it's considered a failure when the patient is admitted to the hospital. That doesn't mean that we don't want to have the best patient's care and the highest quality outcome. But it's a different mindset. It builds on what David was saying earlier. We have to focus on primary prevention to prevent the admission to begin with. So again, global capitation has the ability to align, in, uh, in, uh, if you will, the health incentives, not just the financial incentives. And I'm guessing if you ask most patients, they would prefer not to be admitted to the hospital if we could prevent their illness uh, to begin with. Um, maybe I'll, I'll stop there. I, I think th these, are, these are very important points. Now, uh, let me ask about something that you touched upon as a challenge from our daily work, which is how do you, I mean, one of the problems in our healthcare system, and you could you know, list all the good things, but one of the problems is further and further uh, lack of integration, if you will, of the care. You talked about that coming into the hospital, et cetera. So I'm gonna pose something that is regional, if you will. And the regional thing is we have institutions represented here that either have an employed model of physicians. Some of them are fully employed. Some of them have no employment model whatsoever. And some of them have a hybrid, like Methodist Hospital has a hybrid. I mean, has a physician organization with some employment and private practitioners. So if we still stay in this heterogeneous kind of way of doing things, how do we integrate care? Is this all IT? Uh, what, what is, how do we get this information across knowing that the way we practice is certainly very different than when we were doing it 15, 20 years ago? Hospitalists are there, intensivists are there, so many other sub subspecialty and then handing over from one to another. And then even our training programs nowadays with certain hours, you know, clock is at midnight, then you, know, you change your outfit. So how do we bring this def defragmentation back together? How do we integrate care nowadays going forward? Is this all electronic health record? And once we're there, we can share all that? Mark, I think you're going to have to deal with that because obviously this is our healthcare system here, and I don't see it changing. Yeah, I mean, I guess let me, let me tack a couple, couple parts to that question. First off, Employment does not equal integration. I think anybody who um, you know, has a group of employed physicians will, will attest to that. Um, it, it's really the, the culture that evolves with that group of physicians um, to work together as an integrated group um, that, that I think leads to integration. And I don't believe you have to have an employment model to do that. First off, I think it's unrealistic to think that around the United States we're suddenly going to take every physician uh, in the country and, and employ them all. And, and suddenly have some, you know, wow, everything's all of a sudden fixed. So, you know, right off the bat, I don't believe that's the right model. I think there are tremendous advantages to private practice models. I think there are tremendous advantages to employment models and other models. And I, I think they each have their own pros and cons. So the smart institutions are going to figure out how to harness sort of all the pros and, and, and leave behind all of the different cons. You know, so then you have to ask yourself, okay, so how will you integrate those, those folks? IT is a tool to do that. It's not the solution. 
um, but it is a critical tool. Uh, I said to the group this morning, I'm waiting for the Steve Jobs of healthcare IT to come out and actually create a system that works and a system that's intuitive and a system that's easy to use. Because I will tell you, whatever system you look out there, it isn't there. I mean, you know, it's right now we're going through some transitions and, you know, I've got emails flying all over all weekend on one of those uh, outpatient transitions. Oh, we should just drop the thing. We should get rid of it. And you sit there and say, well, let me just show you the next one because you're going to hate it just as much. <laughs> you know, and, and so IT is going to be part of the solution, but I think we've got a long way as an industry to get the kinds of IT tools we need. You know, but ultimately, um, to, to integrate, what we need to share that information. We need to have a commonality of purpose. So I think when everybody focuses on value, when everybody focuses on the quality, and that's the main conversation that's happening, I think you can integrate people across a, a very broad spectrum. David. You know, I agree with Mark. Whether you're employed or standalone, it makes no difference. You know, there are three things you need. One, you need physician champions. People who will say, you know what, there's a right way and a wrong way of doing what do we do. There's an old adage that says what gets measured gets done. <coughs> We've got to develop scorecards. What are we measuring? How are we defining quality? And how do we, how do we then create a system of care where we say to ourselves, it's not about how I do my practice, how you do your practice, but what is best in this kind of environment. Secondly, where we report our data routinely and hold ourselves accountable for the outcomes that we have. You know, the government, is, the triple aim is real simple. If you improve quality, if you improve outcomes, and by the way, you also improve satisfaction scores, then your cost will come down, guaranteed. So we need physician champions who understand what is important, whether you're employed or not is not the issue. You gotta have the right tools, you gotta have IT. In our system, we have all of our doctors um, have the same EMR and which is, makes it a whole lot easier. But now, you know what, with, with data, or before we thought we had a problem, now we know we have a problem. So the data helps you understand you know, where you need to go. Now, that's a starting point. But once you develop a scorecard of what are we gonna measure, and are these the kind of issues we ought to be focusing on? Volume is not the issue. It's outcomes, um, value added, if you will. So those are the kind of issues we wanna talk about and discuss, but it does require that you get your medical staff totally engaged, and you gotta have people who buy into the concept and live it day in, day out. Great points, David. And I think I, I just wanna amplify this, is it's not only physician champions, is a, an engagement of the physicians. So take, don't take only the champion, take the physicians. And I, I'll tell you from a, car, from a cardiology point of view, the American College of Cardiology, as you know very well, we have a lot of data registries of various you know, clinical situations, be it CAT, PCI, or, or nowadays in uh, Pinnacle, and uh, ICD registries. And you've seen several publications regarding appropriateness, et cetera. And the first thing that comes out is that, well, if I'm in the, you know, I'm much more in the inappropriate range, the first instinct is, you know what it is, is the data is wrong. So if, if I want to, uh, to impact one thing along the lines of what David and all the others have said is that you have to be engaged in these registries. I know from a hospital perspective, nowadays you get individual data regarding your admission for heart failure or whatever it is, you get all that. But I think the other, if you're an interventionist, if you're an ICD, you know, implanter, et cetera, et cetera, you have to take a look at your own data because believe it or not, ultimately, not yet. Ultimately, it will be publicly reported. Maybe not on an individual level, but at an institutional level. STS has done that already, and I know ultimately the college will do that. It is, it's the right thing to do, but it's not yet the thing to do, and the reason for it is you need that engagement of looking at your own data and be critical about it and making sure that you know, it makes sense. There's no other person, unless you take ownership of that data, there's really no other person that has the vested interest as much as you do as, a, as an individual who's gonna look at that, per, uh, that data. David, you have a... Uh, St. Luke's is an interesting laboratory uh, in this regard because 25% uh, uh, of our admissions derive from academic practice, uh, Baylor College of Medicine faculty. 
25% uh, derived from the city's largest independent multi-specialty group practice, uh, Kelsey Siebold, uh, which parenthetically numbered uh, under 200 physicians when I arrived here uh, eight years ago and is now over 350 uh, physicians. So it tells you something about market uh, uh, opportunities. And the balance are uh, the typically small private practices that, uh, that Mark uh, described earlier. And so with all the admitted frailties of uh, data manipulation, and with all the real difficulty of even deciding whose patient is this really over the longest part of the care, uh, and quickly acknowledging that a lot of the decisions are now being made by the new generation of hospitalists who doesn't know the patient at all, I think that was a, a very appropriate uh, point. Uh, but admitting those frailties of, of data management, uh, I think which everyone has, we look forward to an internal competition of sorts as we refine our data uh, such that best practice for matched populations and matched uh, diagnoses uh, uh, at discharge uh, can inform the other parties in our care system. Uh, and it, I don't think it will surprise uh, those here today uh, that the 350-person medical group uh, spends the least for given outcomes by 15%. And this data was first generated uh, uh, internally uh, by Kelsey for purposes of marketplace negotiations. Uh, because obviously if there is a, uh, a delta of that significance, there is a wonderful profit sharing opportunity between the party paying the bill and the party providing the service. And, and for Kelsey in particular, over the last several years, Medicare Advantage has proved to be uh, an extraordinary growth engine because the insurance side lets you be a, a, a partner in the, uh, in the improvement. Uh, now, I don't think these data are going to provide us the kind of uh, definitive leverage that I'd love to have. Uh, until they can be more reliable. I mean, there's just, there are, uh, you know, just a lot of imperfections. I mean, it starts with, okay, so who's on service at the moment of admission and who really follows the patient through the course of admission and who has to sign on to the, the, the decision at, at discharge and uh, all these other variables that, that we know uh, confound the, uh, uh, the analysis. But uh, we've now used uh, third-party uh, resources to evaluate this delta, uh, and they've been corroborated. Uh, uh, so that the, the different care models, uh, at least on the surface, uh, uh, do make a difference. I think it would be great to share these data ultimately when they're, yeah, I mean, it would be nice to take a look at with similar outcome, you got our about and well, you, you, uh, Bill, you sort of send me the home run pitch because, uh, <clears throat> I mean, one of the things that I've, I've felt over my years of participation that has been particularly beautiful about American medicine is that people publish their findings and they do so promptly to inform the profession as a whole. But in what's coming, I think there's going to be more strategic secrets. Because if you find a means of creating economic advantage by doing ABC rather than CBA, is there going to be the same motivation that there used to be in the past to share this with what in the end are increasingly competitive circumstances? I mean, I think this is going to be a future tragedy for, for medicine and for our society. 
So I'm really saying I'm not sure it's going to get published anytime soon. <laughs> but yeah, but uh, keep those secrets. Huh? But I've given you the macro portion of it. Well, I want to shift the, the discussion a bit, all right, since, uh, you know, we have leadership of the ACC here with us, is, and we talked about, you know, data registries and things like this, is uh, inherent in the question is, how can hospital systems, payer systems, systems, healthcare systems, partner in a win-win kind of align the incentives, win-win situations with professional societies. So that's the big question. And maybe specifically for the ACC, what could the ACC do in this arena? Do I have a volunteer there? Well, I, I guess I get to go first being from the ACC. <laughs> <laughs> Although I feel so like I should give Vivian the head. podium. <laughs> so so I, the, one of the innovative ideas, I mean, it sort of ties into all what we're talking about in terms of uh, being more, uh, meeting the, the triple aim in bending the cost curve, delivering care in a better manner, uh, is uh, what I would call a very exciting uh, I don't even want to use the word demonstration project because it's, the, it's on the ground in Wisconsin where uh, a concept of smart care has been put into place. And this is an incredible um, arrangement between the uh, visionary leadership of the Wisconsin uh, chapter of the American College of Cardiology working with a the consortium of care in Wisconsin is very different than Texas. It's very different than many of the states in that they have a um, partnership between the purchasers and the payers that are overseeing a huge proportion of care in Wisconsin. And they're, they're, they have been maybe, I would say, overly transparent related to the data because it's been based on administrative data, which is fraught with hazards. They reached out to the American College of Cardiology. The American Cardiology College of Cardiology pointed out these problems, and then through that growth and trust, have come up with uh, tools to change the, the way care is given. Through the utilization of our registries, where through clinical data, which is better than administrative data, we actually can get a handle of what's really going on, risk adjustment, outcomes, and whatever and transparency through the utilization of a number of um, quality tools that have been built by the staff of the ACC and our volunteers, such as our appropriate use criteria, which I talked about, but not in a manner where they're encyclopedic shelfware, but that they have been incorporated as proactive decision tools at the point of ordering literally as an application on a, on a phone so that people can put in clinical data, figure out which test to order, this sort of thing. And utilizing some of the tools we've worked with with uh, John Spertus and Mid-America Heart related to shared decision making. Collecting the data through the registries, feeding back these outcomes really are going to change uh, care, trying to eliminate the wastage. An important point which we haven't made yet and uh, this is coming from the physician point of view, is we have to make sure as we go into changes of models and figuring out way to uh, improve uh, costs of care, that the hospital can't be the winner, uh, be the only winner. We have to figure out how some of those, uh, the values that are saved, the money is saved, in, in so-called gain-sharing manner is shared with the clinicians themselves who are operationalizing this. So we're very interested, not only is the college interested, but uh, Medicare is very interested uh, in this template that is going on in Wisconsin. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, Mark, any thoughts, or David? Whoever. Yeah, I, <clears throat> it's, at the center of everything's always the patient. It's what, every person here is a physician or a clinician, 
went into medicine to do. It's why I, I went into medicine. It's why I run a hospital system. You know, and so I think the first key is build those collaborations around how do we improve patient care. And so as we look with the, with the college, um, I'm a big believer in data. I'm a big believer in you can't manage what you can't measure. That, that came up a couple times earlier today. Um, a lot of the data we utilize nowadays is still billing data, very imperfect, very frustrating to any clinician because you sit there and, you know, it was abstracted somewhere here or there. It's just in a, a, a billing type system, you know, so I applaud efforts by the ACC, the STS, others to have more robust and meaningful databases um, that, that we can use that are much more clinically relevant. The challenge is still, though, that that's one hell of a difficult task to actually populate those with good data, useful data, meaningful data. Uh, we talked about some of that earlier in a meeting this morning as well. And so, you know, how can we work together to make sure that we are managing the data sets right now in this acute care enterprise, but over time on a longitudinal basis, you know, and really being selective enough that we're measuring things that truly make a difference for patients and, and, and move that value equation. So the things that are gonna help us attain better outcomes and help us, uh, you know, bring down costs. I, I couldn't agree more in terms of the hospital physician sort of balance of things. Um, I think <clears throat> we all need to figure out a way that as we bring the cost curve down, that you know, we are able to do so in a gentle enough fashion from a business perspective, whether you're a physician, whether you're a hospital, uh, you know, that, that this makes sense. Um, but I think we also have to recognize the reality that uh, you know, if we flash forward 10 years from now, I guarantee you every one of us, whether you're a physician, hospital, whatever, your revenue um, you know, on, a, on an adjusted basis will be lower 10 years from now than it is today. So we've gotta be smarter, we've gotta be more efficient, we've gotta figure out how to work together on cost, we've gotta figure out how to work together uh, on the quality and the outcomes. Vivian, do you have? Vivian, please. So, um, what's going on in terms of, I agree very much with what people concluded, that what's going on in terms of re reimbursement changes under the Affordable Care Act is, is, is increment, it's, it's incremental, it's, we're gonna see what works, we're gonna try a lot of different things, and then adjust according to what happens. And so currently the way Medicare has sent out accountable care organizations to be rewarded is the rewards go to the physicians and hospitals who are able to generate cost savings relative to what is occurring now. Now you can imagine what happens in that situation. The institutions that get the most reward are the ones who are actually doing the crappiest job in the first place. And that's not an example of what's going on at the Texas Heart Institute or at Methodist. And so what the ACC, I would like to encourage them to do is to be working with the policymakers, um, with MedPAC, to be thinking about novel strategies for reimbursement that actually reward the top players as well. And, and this is being done, Mary Beth Landrum, she's the best person at Harvard on paper performance, is already aware of this and thinking about this. So there are people to inform and say, look, let's not just give rewards to the, to, to the bottom part of, of the spectrum, let's give rewards that actually encourage cost savings and better performance by our best players. Um, you know, this, some of the, the, a couple of the other things I'm thinking in terms of what David mentioned and, and what Ralph followed up in terms of end of life, that discussion is only going to believe, be believed by the public if it comes from physicians and hospitals first. So, so I would encourage the physicians to do something similar to, I, I guess it came out in Annals of Maternal Medicine sort of, um, sort of, sort of agreed upon measures. Theirs was, was not having to do with end of life care, but in terms of agreed upon measures not to give aggressive care in particular situations when it's not necessary. So that's where the ACC could have a, a large impact. The other thing I, that I see, you know, we're not, we're moving towards accountable care organizations, bundled payment, everything. That's essential. We need more integrated, coordinated care. We're not getting that with the current system where hospitals get reimbursed by DRG and then physicians get get reimbursed by um, fee-for-service. The danger for cardiologists, though, and, and, and I was talking with this with Jim last night, they go through a demonstration project, and it's the cardiologists, the physicians who generate the savings in the project, and then the hospital collected all the rents. And, and so where is that? Where is the incentive for the physicians to improve? So in, in a way, this is where I think there should be some, a little bit more interaction between economists and, and, and physicians in terms of we have a lot of literature on bargaining and negotiations, and, and maybe Mark wouldn't like to hear this, but, but I'm worried that the cardiologist, the physician, will get locked out of, of the performance improvements if, if you're not careful in terms of how you design your contracts and your awards. Uh, I, did, I, did you guys, did the three of you hear that? 
I, I would really have to say that I'm delighted to have the specter of uh, this uh, monolithic hospital uh, uh, enterprise being at the top of the food chain, but I'm rather cynical about that, really. Um, and, uh, you know, as a person who approaches life with a measure of cynicism, I'm really disappointed. And uh, I could tell you that I actually think that hospitals are going to be commoditized and marginalized, ultimately, in this transformation. And I think the physician is going to be much closer to the top of the food chain than the hospital, particularly uh, if you collaborate in ways that bring insurance-oriented approaches into your practice. I mean, I doubt if there's a living person today you know, hasn't uh, heard the story of, of the large clinical organizations, uh, I mean, like, like Kaiser and others, uh, who because of the insurance influence managed to be really having a degree of power steering that, that escaped uh, the profession previously. Uh, that's certainly been at the core of the uh, Kelsey Siebold strategy, and it's been working, I think, extraordinarily well. Um, I think it's been at the very core of the Geisinger uh, strategy, which I think has become uh, so much in the spotlight in the, in the, uh, in the reform uh, debate. Now, uh, it's hard to become an insurance player. I mean, it's expensive, it's heavily regulated, there's lots of reserves. But, uh, and so the, you know, hospitals may attempt to redeploy their capital fairly quickly, I mean, to morph in that direction as opposed to new bed towers and, and other things. But I don't feel as, as physicians you should feel at all locked out of the ability to compete uh, with the hospital sector. Uh, but it really does require a, a level of collaborative effort uh, that hasn't been characteristic, uh, uh, frankly, of the profession in the past. And, and certainly if you look to your own revenue experiences in cardiology in the last uh, two to three years, uh, there's a lot to be learned from that in terms of the interface with government, certainly. David, a, a short answer because I have one more question. All right, just very quickly, you know what, just for the record, I don't belong to AA, but let me say their motto is what? Before you can fix a problem, you have to admit you have a problem. So, folks, we have a problem. Let's admit it. You know, the problem we're having is that we're reacting to things that, for example, the reform bill has challenged us in many areas. You know what? These are people, bar and some David cynicism. They don't know what they're talking about. We do. So rather than react to what they're, they're suggesting, why don't we get together, figure out a way to make it work? Because we know this better than they do. So all we're doing is we're reacting to things they put out there. Why don't we just say, you know what? We have a problem. Here's how we're going to deal with it. Here's how we create a win-win environment for the providers, for the hospitals, so we can work together. And ultimately, that's the solution, guys. All we're doing, we're reacting to what others have said, there's a problem. But they don't understand the genesis of it, nor how to solve it. So they're throwing things out there that are a little bit silly sometimes, but why don't we get together and say, you know what? Here's how we deal with it. Here's how we create win-wins. But we've been very lax in, in responding to that. We're waiting for people to tell us how to get it done. We ought to be out there providing the answers to the solution. I think this is, this is a great point, David, and I know it's been emphasized. Creating win-win situations, aligning the incentives, I think is going to be really the, the way of the future and working collaboratively, meaning healthcare professionals, physicians, hospitals, health systems. Uh, this is really, I mean, the way for the future and emphasizing quality. One thing I want to, uh, that's the last question I have for the panel, and I think it is about the future. And I know several of the attendees here are trainees. Uh, so I want your perspective on it. Uh, they may have the jitters of, you know, going forward into the world where there are questions, and that's why we have this forum, is how does the future look to you? Meaning, 
Um, is it bright from their perspective point of view going forward into uh, cardiovascular specialties, et cetera? Is there any threat for GME research or practice to them? And are, you, are you bullish about the future, or how do you see it? I'm going to go through uh, probably David first here, and then we'll go across. Okay. Uh, I, I happen to have served for the last uh, six years on the board of the ACGME. And uh, uh, Tom Naska, our, our CEO, has, I think, put out a, a well-informed and well-researched paper on what's likely to happen to training slots in this country under the reform that is, uh, is now law. And uh, uh, his best case analysis suggests there will be 33% fewer training slots in American hospitals. Best case. Uh, and he thinks it could be as high as 50%. Now this arises because the number of self-funded training slots in the country is fairly significant. So it's not just what the government will do, it's what the individual hospitals will do as their constraints become more pronounced. Uh, and it was a pretty nice piece of survey re research. It's, uh, it's, it's now been published. And uh, this at the very time that the likely demand for services is going to go in the opposite direction. I mean, so the notion that uh, we could see training constrained and demand for services uh, expand, you know, this, the, the, these two ends don't meet anywhere in the middle. Mark? Yes, a couple. A couple of bad questions. I, I, I completely agree with the concerns about graduate medical education. You know, in, in an, we're already looking at tens of thousands of physician shortage based on most numbers as the population ages over the next couple of decades. And here we are with uh, mismatches between our training slots from the medical schools to the to the hospitals. We've, you know, we like every hospital. I'm sure I know St. Luke's is the same. We've got a bunch of self-funded slots. You know, well, if revenue goes down. A whole big chunk. Surely, that's something that any any rational person is going to going to take a look at, at at the value on. But but let me step back to kind of the beginning part of your question with advice to the young person who's thinking about going in here and, and you know what's the future look like? You know, ask yourself why'd you go into this? I mean, it's going to sound a little pie in the sky here, but you went into this going into medical school. Almost everybody I know, because you said, boy, I am jazzed up by the science of what's happening, and I'm jazzed up by the people side of medicine. That's not going to change. In any one of these environments, you get the incredible privilege of being a physician or the credible privilege of being a nurse or whatever other clinician you are. People let you into their lives at their most vulnerable moments, and you get to be part of that and help guide them through that. I, I think that's an incredible thing. So there's no reason the satisfaction of practicing medicine should be any different. Now, if you're going in because you said, I want to make a million dollars, and I want to drive this, or I want to have this house, or I want to have that, you know, there are much better fields to go into than medicine. I mean, let's all face it. I, I, I went to business school. I watched what my other colleagues, you know, who were younger than me and jumping right into something on Wall Street were doing immediately out of there, um, you know. It, so you're just going to have to set those expectations. Um, that being said, there's still not a field out there where everybody can walk out and pretty much be guaranteed of a six-figure income. Go find any other field in the country that does that. But if you're looking for the seven-figure incomes or the multi-seven-figure <laughs> incomes or the high six-figure incomes, I do think the reality is over time that's gonna that's going to be a little bit of a thing of the past uh, for some of the people that were on that end of the spectrum. So again, I'd go back to folks and say, really take a look at your your motivations, and if your motivations are the right ones, the future is still incredibly bright. Great advice, Ralph. Well, I have nothing really to add to those great comments, other than when during my years on uh, uh, having the the privilege of serving on the ACC leadership and traveling around to all medical centers and meeting with our fellows in training, I invariably, as I see their excellence and their uh, brilliance, uh, yet some of their anxiety, tell them that I'm actually jealous of them because I think this opportunity to start your career in cardiology with all the excitement, with all the science, uh, is a terrific one. We have an aging population cardiovascular disease in general is a disease of the aging. You will always have a job. And uh, we happen to be lucky in Kaiser Permanente because now the absolute best of the best want to join us. 
So there will be, there's a bright future ahead of you, even with the angst of health care reform. Gee, we, we actually had a big boom in number of people applying to get PhD, uh, PhDs in economics this year. So uh, that's where, <laughs> that's, I, it surprised us, but that's, that's where the growth is. So, so the Baker Institute just released a report last month looking at, at the Affordable Care Act and, and, and physician workforce issues and other healthcare workforce issues. The bottom line, I think the most striking part of this information is that there's all sorts of funding and special programs written into the Affordable Care Act to increase our supply of physicians and other clinicians to support um, clinical care. The problem is those have to be funded by Congress. And if those are not funded, we're going to have, well, we already, as, as David said, we have, we have severe shortages in terms of training. They're just going to get worse. So, so there's a lot of promise here in Texas, but I just wanted to remind you, we have six million uninsured people in Texas. All right, now, now a good portion of those people are expected to get insurance, and we are gonna have a big problem trying to deal with this population. We have more people uninsured in Texas than 30 other states have in population alone. And so, um, as a physician, you're going to be very busy, and, and I just don't see how we're gonna be able to meet the need. That's incredible. You know, the future is both exciting and frightening. It's like you're on a roller coaster that's going straight up, and you're just hanging on for dear life, because it can be pretty scary, but you will, We'll come out of the other end, hopefully alive, and, and I would say there's the future is going to come no matter what we do. So we either are part of the solution or we get away from it. Now, it's not a place for the timid, I would agree, but I would rather be involved in coming up with an answer than be told what the answer is. Uh, so ultimately, I do believe that the, op the opportunities are very exciting. I do worry about GME funding. Um, ultimately, we need education, research, and service, all three. However, there seems to be a major emphasis on service and less on education and research. However, we gotta figure out a way to make it work. You can't have one without the other two. They're all symbiotic. But again, I believe that uh, what, what, what Mark said earlier is why do we get into this business? It's not because of the money. I've often said many, many times that this is my ministry. This is not my job, this is my ministry. So if it is your ministry, it changes what you do and why you do it. But ultimately, I do believe the future is exciting, um, and I believe that we'll, we'll be fine when it's all said and done, but change is inevitable. Well, thank you, David. On this uh, upbeat note, mm -hmm. I want to thank you for coming here. Uh, my message to you is I know you're doing a wonderful job, but think about total health care in addition to what you individually do. And whoever you get in touch with, particularly the new graduates or the students or the residents, let them think about the value of what you're doing. It is a very exciting specialty, or even medicine is, is incredibly exciting, and that's why we're in it. But I think at the same time, we have to be mindful of something that is special that is given to us. And it is a privilege to be a physician or healthcare professional. But at, at the same time, we have to mind our house so we have a sustainable healthcare system. I wanna thank uh, wonderful panelists to us today who came. I wanna thank the American College of Cardiology Executive Committee of them visiting the medical center and being engaged and uh, look forward to seeing you around. Thank you very much.